Wonderful. Okay. So, uh, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Dr. Taylor Clem with UFIFS Extension here in Alachua County, Florida. Um, and today I'm actually with two of our Master Gardener volunteers, Mark Frank and Ann Hudson, and they're going to help answer some of the questions that you all may post. Um, so, any questions that you do have, feel free to put them in the QA box um, on your Zoom screen. Um, you should be able to see that at the bottom, or it might be at the top, it depends on which device you're using. But put your questions in there and we we can help respond to those in there. Um, and as well as part of security for the program, you have the inability to um, you have the inability to use your microphone as well as do use your camera. Um, but you can communicate to the panelists. So me, Mark, uh, so sorry, Mark, Ann, and I. Uh, you can communicate through the chat box, but also the ask those questions through the QA and we can help respond to those as we go throughout the program. Um, and also on the chat box, um, you might have to open up a few times because I'll be asking some questions. I'd love to get your feedback from. So um, to get going, I just wanna thank everybody for joining us. So today's program is New Homeowner's Guide to the Landscape. So, you know, one of the big things that we really think about when putting together this program is we know that it's, it's like about a thousand people a day are moving to the state of Florida. And we know that development is happening um, in Alachua County. And Alachua County is actually considered an urbanizing county because of how quickly it's kind of uh, growing and spreading because of that influx of that population. So we thought it would be a really good idea to help put together this new program for Alachua County that's called that New Homeowner's Guide to the Landscape. And our goal is to help share this basic information for anybody that is a homeowner or a new homeowner to kind of get you prepared or provide those resources for you. So if you are working a landscape for the first time or if you're really well experienced, you have just that basic knowledge and understanding um, of how to manage landscapes in Florida. Because if you're from out of state, um, you'll find that landscape management is completely different um, here than most other parts of the country. So I want to thank everybody for joining us today. Um, and, you know, before we like really jump into the crux of the content of the, the presentation, go ahead in the chat box and answer the question and like, you know, what is the most intimidating thing about um, managing a landscape? And go ahead and put that in that chat box. Let me see what you think. And if you're a first time home buyer or if you're a new homeowner, that's wonderful. Um, but if also, if you've been living at your house for a while, you know, what is that most intimidating thing? Put it in the chat box for us. Yeah, watering. Watering, how much water, when? you know, <laughs> keeping plants alive. That's a very common thing. Yeah. What's a grass versus a weed? Excellent. A right combination of flowers, herbs, etc. for Alachua's climate. Perfect. Yes, tree decisions. That's a really, really tough one that we have to deal with a lot is knowing when a tree is risk at a risk where consider removing it or not. And there's just so many different cogs, so much information um, that it is really hard for us to, you know, kind of keep track of it because it just could be very, very overwhelming at some times. So um, please, you know, with all these different inputs, especially if you move into a new home, it's like, I live in an HOA, I don't live in an HOA, there's code requirements, this landscape's already here, I'm trying to make decisions, there's all these different things that are coming at you. The one thing I always like to tell people is don't panic. <laughs> don't panic um because there's so much stuff that can go on with your landscape and if you get that reference you don't need a towel because our goal is at the end of today's program you'll feel at least confident enough that um you will be able to understand just some of the basics for managing that landscape. And yeah, it looks wonderful. The stuff that y'all are putting in here is so great. Yes, yeah, so a really understanding soil. Um, 
yeah, North Florida plants, natives, deer resistant plants. Excellent. So some of this stuff is very specific. So we may not be able to hit on all of these topics because we're going to hit the major things. So it's like if you're moving into a new home, you're always going to have like that turf grass, that ornamental beds and trees. And what now? What do we do? How do we manage that? And we'll jump into all of that. So um, what we want to do is really think about these essential questions. At the conclusion of today's program, you should be able to answer these three big questions. What is UF IFAS extension in the FFL program? What are the essential landscape management practices? So these are the bare basics. And then what resources or sorry, which resources are available to homeowners in Alachua County. So the FFL program, that's a Florida Friendly Landscaping program. And we'll talk a little bit about that in case you haven't heard of it before. So let's jump into what is extension. So what is extension? Very briefly, it, um, kind of, it was established with the Smith-Lever Act of 1914. And it is part of that land grant university system. So in the state of Florida, we have two land grant universities, the University of Florida and FAMU or Florida A&M. Um, but the main part of extension is really provides education in the three areas, agriculture, human and natural resources and the life sciences. So with the University of Florida or UF IFAS extension or UF IFAS, um, the University of Florida Institute of Food and Agricultural Sciences, you know, we really look at that, we call it, we say, we say the solutions for your life and it's the, our mission um, is to, our goal is to develop knowledge relevant to agricultural, human and natural resources and to make that knowledge accessible to sustain and enhance the quality of human life. So in UF IFAS, so it's kind of broken down in three major areas, which is teaching, research and extension. So teaching is what's happening on campus. So like teaching and education with the students and those degree programs. Research falls in, well, that research, all the research that's happening with the different specialists um, and you know other researchers, professors, etc., cetera, um, all across the university, as well as all the partners that they have globally and with other different research institutions. And then extension, that's where I'm part of it. Extension was what was created as part of that Smith-Lever Act. And extension takes all of that research or science-based information that we're getting from um, the university through that research and we're applying it based off of the needs or learning about the needs of the community um, and then extension kind of be, becomes that way that we say okay here's all the cool things we're learning so what what does it mean for us the, the Floridians and how we're making sure that we are you know going back to agriculture human and natural resources how are we making sure we're improving and protecting that whether it be for ourselves or communities or the state. But it's really important that we think about what are some of the what are some ways poor landscape management uh, what are some ways poor landscape management impacts Florida? Go ahead and put that in the chat box. Thinking about you know in extension horticulture is part of that, but what are some of the poor landscape management practices and how are they impacting Florida? Go ahead and put that in the chat box. Big one, yeah, yeah, water quality. Waterways, it, protecting water quality and quantity, quality and quantity are huge, yeah. Yeah, so the image is definitely a clue. <laughs> Soil erosion, that's another great one. Soil erosion is, is an absolute, that occurs all over the place. Yes, encroaching on wild areas or wildlife or uh, habitat fragmentation, invasive species. Yeah, so uh, yeah, invasive species. There's a lot of plants that were brought into our landscapes because someone goes, "Hey, that looks that's a really beautiful plant. I'm going to put it here," and the next thing you know, it spreads crazy. Yeah, plants that have just high water needs. If you'd have the inability, and that's problematic, if you have an inability to actually. Uh, give them enough water naturally. So those are all great. So yeah, I mean, you all hit the big ones. 
wildlife quality, quantity, and habitat. So those are the three kind of, to me, some of the big ways that Florida landscapes negatively impact Florida's environments. <coughs> Sorry. <clears throat> And one of those regarding to water is that approximately 60% of homeowner water use in Florida is for lawn and landscape irrigation. That's a lot. That's a lot of water. You know, when we're looking at homes that are using irrigation systems, of course, if you don't have an irrigation system, <laughs> you're zero um, percent. But <clears throat> Uh, but anyway, so approximately 60% of homeowner water use in Florida is for lawn and landscape irrigation. That's a lot of water. So that's that's a lot of the water that we're using. And when it's not being used or done properly, then it leads to runoff. It can lead to that water can help contribute to erosion, which can impact water quality um, be, and as well as just soil loss. But it, it, that soil loss can impact water quality negatively, um, but as well as all the non-point source pollutants that can be associated with landscapes. And a lot of those non-point source pollutants like uh, nitrogen, phosphorus, um, like any type of excessive herbicides uh, or any pe pesticides in general, or even things that are associated with like, I didn't pick up my dog poo. Like fecal coliform is a major, major contributor to um, water pollution in the state. Um, <clears throat> But anyways, so 60% of homeowner water use in Florida for lawns and landscape irrigation, that's a lot of water. So when we actually look at the state of Florida, it's um, a lot of you have probably seen this map before because I know some of you have been to these programs, but I like to really show this because it really shows how we are anticipating Florida to change. So earlier I said, we're having about a thousand people move into the state, not move around the state, but move into the state every single day. That's a lot of people, you know, um, and looking at this map, this is what Florida looked like in 2005. The red is developed. So that's like residential, commercial, institutional, you know, things like that, like paved, hardscapes, uh, managed landscapes. Um, the green is like conservation in perpetuity and the rest is like agriculture, land, etc. So <clears throat> agriculture, other conservation areas, wildlife management, um, but anyway, undeveloped areas. But um, so looking at this, we're saying, okay, so this is what the state looks like in 2005, but we do know 100% that there's certain development patterns. And those development patterns is kind of what's driving the development of the state. Um, and when we have more people wanting to come in, that development pattern spreads quicker um, at a faster rate. Um, and we do know that between 2005 and 2060, this comes from the Florida 2060 plan. There is a Florida 2070 plan as well. And it's the same, pretty much a lot of the same data. Um, but we do know as that population is expected to double from 2005 to 2060, we do know what's going to kind of look like with that population and how that development pattern is going to look. So that's significant change throughout the state. Um, and just looking at that, you're like, whoa, okay. There's a lot of people coming and things are really changing across the state. It's gonna really change the character of the state in some areas as well. And it has already done that significantly in our lifetimes. So this is important that we think about. It's like, okay, the population is increasing significantly and 60% of our water use, if you have irrigation is attributed to that irrigation. Woo, boy, that's a lot. So, um, I don't have that slide. So what ends up happening is as that population doubles, we can anticipate that water use is going to double unless we don't change anything. What's going to happen is we're going to have a decrease in that natural habitat, which is going to increase stormwater runoff, which is going to increase erosion rates, is going to impact our water quality even more. Um, and it can actually make us have a loss of fresh water resources just in general because we're losing that natural recharge of our aquifer, where we have some things in streams and creeks that end up out in the ocean. Um, and the more we have fresh water leaving, compared to what's coming in, we can have a freshwater uh, depletion as well as just the freshwater depletion with associated with usage. So um, that's important. It's like, okay, th this, this is a high need that we need to consider ourselves and our landscapes is a significant 
contributor or it can be a significant solution to the problem. So that's why we have the Florida Friendly Landscaping Program. And this is a state extension program because the university has for a long time now has recognized the need of making sure that we're using horticulture uh, properly and following best management practices. And this is very much so for the residential environments, for the built community, for the built environment. So the Florida Friendly Landscaping Program, it is, if you don't know, an integrated approach to maintaining an attractive, colorful, and diverse yard. It's friendly to wildlife, it's environmentally responsible, and it's less work than a traditional landscape, kinda. It really depends because you can do, you know, very specific management practices for uh, very specific plant material, and it can lead to um, increased labor, but if you're just picking, you know, simple massing plants, Florida friendly is a lot less work. <laughs> um, but its goals is to conserve water, protect water quality, and enhance and protect biodiversity. And we do know that following Florida friendly landscaping principles can significantly decrease water usage. We actually did a study where we compared a traditional Florida landscape, kind of what we're seeing and it's happening in this map, to a Florida friendly landscape. And the Florida friendly landscapes are using about 80%, 85% less water than a traditional Florida landscape. Landscape. That's huge. That's significant. That's a significant reduction. And there's some homeowners that's like, I, my water bill is 10 bucks, you know, <laughs> because of how much, how little water they're using in their landscape. Um, so the Florida Friendly Landscaping Program is based around nine principles, and we do have programs in our county extension office that dives into deep detail about these nine principles. But they are right plant, right place, water efficiently, fertilize appropriately, mulch, attract wildlife, manage yard pest, recycle, reduce stormwater runoff, and protect the waterfront. So someone mentioned soil earlier and some of the things that you really need to consider, and that's 100% true. Soil is the foundation of everything. And we're actually looking at maybe somewhere in the future we can think about these nine principles and uh, principle number four, mulch, ends up becoming more of a principle about soil health, which can improve which can include use of mulch that can be used for um, soil. But anyways, so the Florida Friendly Landscaping is a collection of practices involving design, installation, operation, and maintenance, which are intended to reduce irrigation water use, protect water quality, quality from overuse of fertilizer and pesticides, and reduce stormwater runoff. <clears throat> But to me, one of the first principles, that very first principle is that right plant, right place. And we have our online plant selection guides. And actually, one of the resources I'm going to give you actually has a, uh, a copy of that, re that plant selection guide. But right plant, right place is the crux of that plant selection process, where we look at what are those environmental conditions, the climate conditions, water needs, um, water availability, the size plants is get. And it allows us to say, OK, knowing that these conditions that we're going to plant we know which plants that we should select. We want to make sure that those plants that like they have those certain environmental preferences in which they like to live or be planted in, let's put those in that environment. You know, don't put something that prefers shade and full sun and vice versa. Don't put something that needs lots of water in a location where you'll have to irrigate it all the time or it's so dry it's not going to be successful. Because if you have unhappy plants that are not in an environment that they thrive and survive, they're going to create a lot of issues down the road. So, um, that right plant, right place is, I think, that, that crux moment of everything with the FFL program and thinking about landscape sustainability and the Florida Friendly Landscaping Program is because following that practice helps reduce water use, helps protect water quality. It can, uh, it can enhance uh, landscape wildlife habitat as well as it can re significantly reduce any type of other inputs like fertile and or even eliminate like fertilizer um, and any other pesticide. Uh, so it's kind of a neat thing, but that really starts with that right plant, right place. So um, the FFO program has three major program areas. It's the home landscapes and community landscapes, landscape professionals, and they're about to introduce a fourth that they're working on right now. It's a, actually the entire 4-H youth uh, development curriculum. Um, <clears throat> And that's going to be a great way to kind of help take into schools, work with youth, more kind of taking that information on the floor for the landscaping program and targeting it towards youth. But our big one is that home landscapes. 
So we have kind of a background of what extension is. Our goal here is to meet the needs of the community and really constantly addressing what those needs are. And part of that is making sure that we're using science-based information or the research-based information to determine what those best management practices are for managing our landscapes. Because if we're not doing that, we're really impacting Florida's environment and ecosystem, as well as, you know, it requires us to put a lot of time, energy, and effort into our landscapes, which we may not want to do. Or you might end up having to fight like disease and pests and pathogens and all that in your landscape where just following those recommendations or the science-based recommendations can help alleviate all of that from the very get-go. And again, that starts with right plant, right place. So what we want to do is thinking about what would a new homeowner need to know? Um, we chunked it into these four major topic areas because they're pretty much gonna be in every single landscape to the most part. So we have turf grass, irrigation, ornamentals, and then just briefly, we're talking a little bit about pest management. Um, so let's go ahead and let's just jump into this first essential element. Let's talk about turf grass maintenance and management. So what's the difference between lawn and turf? So, you know, sometimes that term is kind of like thrown around a bit and you can pull it up in Webster Dictionary or something like that. And it'll mention, you know, that sometimes lawn and turf are the same exact thing. Well, no, not necessarily. So a lawn is typically just considered a low area, area in between like a Renaissance Middle English definition is it's a low area uh, between shrubs or trees kind of like within a forested area. Um, but somewhere along the way, it's like also defined as it's like, oh, that means turf grass. Well, turf grass is a better way to say it's a plant species. Um, and a lawn can be essentially made up of whatever plant species that are low ground covers that fill that low growing space within the shrubs and the trees. Um, so I like to kind of create a definition um, because, you know, it allows us to think a little bit differently about our landscapes. So specifically, we're going to be talking about turf grass because it is such a predominant landscape plant um, through, or throughout the entire state. Um, but there's nothing saying that if available that you can't use like multi-species lawns where you're using turf grass, other forbs, um, herbs and things like that that you grow nice and low that take little to no maintenance. So it really comes down to what I like to say is functionality. And functionality goes back to right plant, right place. Um, one of the benefits that you get from turf, like for me, I have two kids. So they're running around constantly um, outside. Well, one's running around constantly. The other one's only eight months old. But they're using the, the we know that they're going to be using that turf grass. And it is the most tolerant of usage where other plants you just trample them to death and that bare soil is worse than having uh, um, the bare soil is not what you want put it that way um, it's worse than any other alternative so um, so it's really important to think about you know having this turf grass is in areas where it's functional if it's not functional and you don't want turf grass there should be no reason for you to have it the only other way that it should be required that you'll see that it's required is like if you have an HOA they say you have to have turf grass in this space um, but anyways so before I digress too much we're going to really focus on that turf grass just because it is such an integral component of residential landscapes across the state. And this is a great way that if you don't have turf grass, cool. If you do, that's wonderful. And if you don't have it, this is a great way for you to learn and help educate others because majority of the time, a lot of the stuff that we're seeing done in turf grass is not proper maintenance or management. So there are uh, five um, major turf grass species that we do see within our landscapes. There's St. Augustine, Zoysia, Bahia, and Centipede, and Bermuda. Now I nixed Bermuda because in Alachua County we actually have fertilizer ordinances and codes, which I'll talk about a little bit. And because of those ordinances, we have the inability to properly really manage Bermuda 
Bermuda grass successfully. So, and it's a little bit more resource intensive. So I kind of point people away from it, um, especially for homeowners. And most yards anyways that are new, new built are getting St. Augustine or Zoysia. More rural areas are gonna have a mixture of Bahia or centipede, predominantly Bahia. I like Bahia because it's much easier. <laughs> So those are a major turf grass species. Um, and then we'll talk about the first step. What's the very first thing that you do? And then we'll break down those manage main management practices, mowing, watering, and fertilizing. So if you're thinking about turf grass management, what's the first thing you do? It's really the first thing you do for anything in your landscape. Go ahead and put that in the uh, chat box. What's that first thing you do when you're thinking about your landscape? A hint is the picture. <laughs> yeah. Oh, y'all are so good. Yeah. So soil test. Do soil tests. One person proposed choose the right turf. That's 100% correct. Choose the right turf because and knowing your soil conditions will really help determine what turf you can use or what works best and as well as you know when we start thinking about management um we can really determine what we need to do if there needs to be any fertilizing or nutrient inputs and uh someone mentioned check the soil acidity or alkalinity so what's your soil ph that's that's huge that's that's a huge component because you do a soil test and it can help determine or tell you what your soil ph is and there's a lot of times where it's like your turf grass it's gonna be way too acidic for st augustine and zoysia so you're gonna need like bahia or centipede or on the other end of it it's like i have a more of an alkaline soil which does happen really more within our urban areas where St. Augustine and Zoysia is going to be the only appropriate turf grass species and that's just based off of pH. So it's the first step is always understanding the soil conditions and doing a soil test. So let's go ahead and let's jump into and I'll include um, in, the, in the documents that I give you, you're going to actually have a form for that soil test form and I'll include a link in the follow up email that I send that gets you directly to that. So let's talk about the main management practices for turf grass. So mowing, a lot of times people don't think about mowing, but mowing height plays a huge role in turf grass health. Um, I see it's happened so many times where turf grass is mowed way, way, way too short. Um, and that leads to major issues. Um, so you, you mow your, your mow height is based off of your turf grass type. So we're like St. Augustine, you need your turf grass to be between around three to four inches. For zoysia, two to two and a half. Bahia can be three to four. Um, and centipede is at one and a half to two. Um, I do have St. Augustine and zoysia which are bolded just because of the most dominant turf grass species that we have within our urbanizing area. Um, and to determine kind of like what our mow height is, that's what you can see in that image on the right side of your screen. You just put your lawn mower up on a flat surface and you just measure from the ground to the mow deck or that mow height. So that very bottom of the lawn mower on there, it's reading like three and three quarters of an inch approximately. So that's ideal for like St. Augustine grass or Bahia. So that's how you determine your mow height. Um, and then you only, you never, but you never remove more than one third of the blade at a time. Even if your grass is really high or there's certain height that you can lift your lawnmower, but never remove more than a third of the blade. Because, you know, even though proper mowing is essential to helping maintain a healthy, strong turf grass stand, um, the, it's still stressful for that plant. So if you can minimize how much you're cutting off and making sure that it's within that healthy range, it allows that turf grass to recover much quicker um, and be healthier as a result. Um, and what happens by proper mowing creates healthy, deep roots because our biggest goal with turf grass is create healthy roots if we if we manage the turf grass well it's going to encourage deeper root growth a stronger root system and that's going to make a much stronger turf grass stand that has the ability to uptake as many nutrients as possible it has a very limited pest to damage it, it, all things with it it helps eliminate so it's important to think about proper mowing because improper mowing leads to poor drought tolerance as well as just any bad thing that happens with turf.
it'll help contribute to. So making sure that you follow proper mowing is gonna be essential for your landscape or turf grass health. Um, so just consider that is that mow and one of the issues that we do see a lot is that scalping which is mowed way too short and what that does is the turf grass then is in like super recovery mode it's trying to heal itself and when it's doing that it can't focus on those roots so the roots get weaker and they get shorter and next thing you know it your turf grass is more susceptible to all types of all the bad things disease pests you name it so mow height is essential Next is watering for the turf grass and we'll jump into more detail with the irrigation in a bit but just for turf grass you never want to apply more than um, half an inch to three quarters of an inch per application and that's because turf grass roots are within the top six to nine inches of the soil and one inch of water fills one foot of our soil the top 12 inches of our soil so um there's no need to apply deeper than the root zone of turf grass. And if we do, it's complete waste of water. You're using way too much water and um, all of a sudden you're over irrigating and it's gonna significantly impact the quality of your turf grass. But our actual recommendation from the university is to just turn off your entire irrigation system completely unless turf shows signs of drought stress. So you only turn on your irrigation for turf grass when your turf grass is showing signs of drought stress. Because what it's going to do is you get closer to that drought stress, what happens is those roots want to grow further. They're looking for water. They're like, I'm going to have, I'm going to go reaching out. I'm going to look for more and more water. So you get a stronger root system. But if you irrigate more, the roots don't have to try as hard. So they whoop, they sink up or they shrink up. You're getting more, uh, I don't need to try as much. So the next thing you know, it, the roots are getting smaller and smaller. And that all of a sudden they lose their drought tolerance. They don't have the ability to ward off disease, pests, insects, you name it. They're just unhealthy because they don't have a strong root system. Um, and then the duration, because sometimes people say, I run my irrigation for 30 minutes, 20 minutes. You know, you gotta be careful because the duration of irrigation, um, the duration, of irrigation is dependent on the, I wrote that down so wrong, um, but the duration and um, that you irrigate um, for like how long are you irrigating is really dependent off your irrigation system to apply that one half to three quarter of an inch. You can have one zone that can apply a half an inch in 10 minutes, but you can have another zone that can take 45 minutes to apply that half inch. So it's important to really understand how deep of an application you're putting out. And um, I'll have, have an image later in the program that kind of shows you an easy way to, to measure that water so you can calculate how long to run your system. But you still have your timer and uh, most people use their timers to turn their system automatically on and off. And it's important to think that we do have our summer and winter hours here in Alachua County. And it's based off of your uh, your address. So in the summer, you can irrigate twice a week in the winter once. Um, and that's the maximum. And remember, we recommend just turning your irrigation system off. But these are the maximum durations that's given out in the county and St. John's River Water Management. Um, and it's based off of the time change. And I always recommend irrigating in the morning before 10 a.m. Um, and never the evening because excess water that might be sitting on your plants will dry up. Whereas the excess water in the evening, it's gonna be sitting there all night before it wants to dry up or, um, and then that can help, that would increase the likelihood that you can end up getting like a disease. So, um, but poor irrigation watering practices lead to all bad things that happen in the landscape. So when we look at turf grass issues, it's typically associated with improper improper mowing, improper irrigation, um, and irrigation, your irrigation system is a tool if rainfall is not adequate. Your lawn will significantly thank you for doing that. So that's why we say just turn it off, keep it off, don't keep it on the automatic run, only turn it on when necessary, and your surf grass will thank you for it. 
So uh, the next, let's talk a little bit about fertilizer. So Alachua County does have a fertilizer code. And in that fertilizer code, you can only apply nitrogen um, and phosphorus in the months of March, April, May, and June. The rest of the year is blackout for those two nutrients. So um, what you need to do is, and then March, it's not growing season for turf grass. So from our recommendations and what we know about turf grass growth, don't use March. So you actually only have April, May, and June to apply any type of fertilizer or your nitrogen and phosphorus to your turf grass. So that's why it's really important because that's what impacts actually what that that's why we, I say don't use Bermuda because you can't apply it, uh, fertilizer enough to help maintain it because it absorbs so much of the nutrients. If it doesn't absorb enough, um, then it's not going to be a healthy turf grass stand. So, but fertilize based off of your turf grass type because all turf grasses have different rates of nitrogen that they prefer. Um, and any more than that will lead to pollution runoff and, non, and contribute to non-point source pollution where like St. Augustine grass, um, you can get by with an application, one pound of nitrogen per thousand square feet um, per application or two pounds total a year. So an application in April and June, one pound each. You can get by with that and that turf from, that, from our research that we have, it's gonna have over 99.99% uptake efficiency. It's, it's significant. It's huge. Um, but you apply more than what we recommend, you're contributing to uh, non-point source pollution. So um, so St. Augustine and Zoysia, both, you can just do two pounds of nitrogen per thousand square feet a year total. And you break that up into one pound each um, in April application and a June application. Do uh, mid-April, mid-June, and your turf grass will be good to go. You can always apply like potassium and iron um, and other nutrients throughout the year, but nitrogen and phosphorus are the big ones that we're concern concerned about. Um, Bahia grass only needs about one to two pounds per year. Uh, you can get by with a single application. You could do two if you'd like. And centipede is so minimal, like one, you can get by with that 0 0.4 and it works wonderful. You can do a two pounds, but that's like um, pretty high maintenance centipede. And if you're managing centipede, you typically are going to be doing that 0.4 pounds. So single application, and that's not much at all. Um, but only apply, based off our county code, you can only apply, and as well as best management practices, you can only apply one pound of nitrogen per thousand square feet per application. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about how we calculate that in the next slide. And it must contain 50% slow release nitrogen. Again, I'll talk to you about how we can do uh, calculate that. And you can apply no phosphorus at all unless a soil test shows you're deficient. So phosphorus is naturally occurring within our soils anyway. So it's, I've looked at hundreds of soil test results over the past few years. And I've only had a handful where people are actually deficient in phosphorus. Um, and it's just because phosphorus is naturally occurring in our soils and it's bound in the soil. Whereas typically the nutrient that we apply for the phosphorus does not bind to the soil. So it moves very readily through the soil and contributes to pollution. Um, so no phosphorus unless you have a soil test indicating that you're deficient. So let's look a little bit about uh, how do we determine how much to apply and what is considered slow release or not. So that uh, slow release nitrogen, one pound per thousand square feet. And again, you'll have all these resources that I'm going to give to you um, to make it easily available. So we always need to calculate in. So how much, I have a bag of fertilizer, how much nitrogen do I have? Um, and how much do I apply, you know, especially for thinking about the rates that we need to apply it. So when we look at our fertilizer bag, you see those big three numbers. On this example, it's 20010. That means nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium. Um, and that is standardized on every single fertilizer bag. So what we're seeing is 20% of that bag is nitrogen, 0% is phosphorus, and 10% is potassium. And if you look at the bottom of that label, you'll see like a little asterisk. Boop, boop, boop. It says 14% slowly available urea nitrogen from polymer coated sulfur coated urea. So I know that's a mouthful, um, but the biggest thing is slowly available. That means 14% um, is slow release. 
Um, so now we need to determine, okay, so I see that 14% um, is slow release, and it's not 14% of that total 20. It's, it does seem kind of confusing. But to determine if something is a slow release or not, so we know that 14% is that slow release, and we just divide it by 20. So 14 divided by 20, and you see in that example, is... 0.7 or 70%. So that's greater, that's 50% or greater. So that means it's considered a slow release fertilizer. So that's all you have to do is just divide those two numbers. Um, and then you'd have to determine how much do I apply? Like, how do I make that calculation for a thousand square feet? That, that can get the confusing part. So what you do is you just take one um, and then you divide it by that percent total nitrogen. So the example is one, that's a constant that we use for 1000 square feet, um, we're doing this calculation. Um, and then so that one divided by 0.2 and that'll give you five. So five pounds of that fertilizer will make sure that you have one pound of nitrogen for thousand square feet. So I mean, 20% of five is one. So one, five pounds of that uh, fertilizer will make sure that you apply um, that one pound of nitrogen. So what we usually recommend is you apply half of your fertilizer walking one direction in your space. And then you apply the other half, kind of walk in the other direction, perpendicular, so like a basket weave pattern that helps with uniform distribution of that fertilizer in your landscape. So this fertilizer label stuff can be very confusing um, because it's like, oh man, Taylor, I can't learn about landscapes and you're making me do math. I apologize. But we do have resources and links and how, and you'll get all these to make sure to help you calculate your nitrogen uh, from looking at your fertilizer label. And also, you know, if you, Un over or under fertilizing can lead to all bad things. So pest disease, fungus, poor roots, and whatever enter your bad thing here can occur. So now let's talk about irrigation. Oh, this image, I always show this image on the right because it drives me crazy because that is an incredibly inefficient use of irrigation. You're having so many pop-up heads. There's a little strip of turf grass where it is. Why is that functional? Um, and because you have to maintain that. And um, there's like sprinkler heads, spring, sprinkler heads, spring, sprinkler heads. And that is a lot of water. So I bet they have a bunch of fungus issues that happen in that landscape. Um, but then also on the left, what you're actually seeing is um, a brown rot specifically, um, not necessarily take all root rot, but that is one of our common issues that we have come into our landscape people are having issues with their turf grass is related to just over irrigation because they get some type of fungus a uh, fungal pathogen that ends up killing their turf grass and it's like well if you reduce your irrigation it'll help stop the spread of it and then they reduce their irrigation and it stops spreading because that fungus goes away um, now they do have a dead patch that they have to fill in but nonetheless you know just proper irrigation will make your plants be healthier and stronger and also reduce any risk of any bad things that happen. So um, again, how often and when? So when we're looking at like specifically turf grass um, or sorry, turf grass or ornamental plants, it doesn't matter what it is. Um, you know, you can look for folded leaf blades. Uh, they lose color a little bit like turf grass gets bluish green color um, and when you walk around your landscape your turf you can actually see your footprints because the plants aren't springing back um, and then like some ornamental plants will start to get droopy leaves they kind of get crunchy um, those are all signs it's like oh we need to add some water or this is very this is in drought conditions and at that point is when you can start to think about irrigating your plants um, and with turf grass, again, it's that one half inch to three quarter inch per application. Um, and only irrigate is ne needed. And for ornamentals, you know, after plant establishment, so if you're moving to a new home, more than likely your plants are already established, little water is needed. So I actually recommend hand watering your ornamental plants um, only when they're drought stressed. And you don't have to water all of them because you might have some that might be drought stressed before others are. And uh, going back to how do we know we're applying a quarter, that half inch or three quarters inch of irrigation, 
I cat food cans. Those are the best. <laughs> you lay them out in the landscape and you just turn your system on and you see how much water is falling in those cans and you can just measure them. And you can determine are their areas getting too much water, or too little waters and make sure that it's spreading uniformly across the landscape. Um, and that's how you can determine how long you need to run your irrigation system for. So one thing that's really important is there's different types of irrigation. Um, by code in Alachua County, you're going to have micro irrigation uh, within your ornamental beds and you'll have like pop-up rotors or something called micro spray micro trajectory or msmt um, within your turf grass areas or you may not have anything you'll be hose dependent or you just don't have one um, yeah. um, but it, it's important to think about water usage so when we're looking at turf grass those pop-up rotors they are heavy water users because there's not an efficient way yet really that's effective to apply water to our turf grass and we actually measure that water in gallons per minute whereas our ornamentals we're using that micro irrigation for that plant establishment or to help apply during periods of drought um, and you see like micro sprays or drip irrigation it's and the drip irrigation is going to be the most efficient um, you can use a hose as well you don't need to use those but that rate is measured in gallons per hour so you can definitely see that a gallons per minute and a gallons per hour you can definitely see that ornamental beds use significantly less water or you may have to run that system much longer to make sure you're getting enough water out into the landscape but typically the ornamentals the shrubs and all that stuff trees you, once they're established you don't really have to worry about them so get smart you know we have smart irrigation technology um technology can help inform our irrigation timer if irrigation is actually needed so we're so used to seeing a rain sensor rain sensor is pretty common in all of our homes but nobody ever replaces the cork inside of it if you don't replace the cork then next thing you know it um that's no longer functioning and then what that rain sensor would do is tell your irrigation timer we've had a plenty of water go ahead and turn their system off and it'll turn the entire system off but if that cork's not there it'll never do that so in Alachua County if you still have one of the systems it's great but all new systems have to use something like a soil moisture sensor or a weather-based controller I really like the soil moisture sensors and that's what you see in this image you actually bury it in the sunniest part of your landscape about six to eight inches deep um, right or six to nine inches right where that root zone is um, and it'll constantly take soil moisture readings and it might not rain like for three four days but you know what there's still a lot of moisture in the soil and the rain sensor will be like hey you're good and it'll turn off the irrigation system so it's really neat it's a better tool at saving water compared to a rain sensor because the rain sensors if you don't replace a cork it doesn't work a rain sensor will actually let you know if there's an error and it's not working and but typically once it's in the ground you don't have to touch it maintain it for years um, so which is really nice and weather-based controllers actually just read the weather they're hooked up to weather stations or you can have your own weather station and then it'll take information about evapotranspiration rates heat all that stuff that would influence um, how quick things dry out and it'll tell your irrigation system if it's run or not those are really effective tools as well so now let's go ahead and jump into out of the, uh, so we talked about turf grass and irrigation. Let's talk about the ornamentals. So ornamentals, we're, we're going to talk a little bit like the mulching, fertilizing, watering, and pruning of the plants within our ornamental beds. So mulching, never do this. This is my landscaping pet peeve or one of them. That's volcano mulching. You see that everywhere. That's death of a tree. Um, it's going to be very problematic um, and it, it is a slow death for the tree so but anytime we're mulching only apply about two to three inches of mulch and avoid direct contact with the trunk or the base of the plant because that mulch will hold against that trunk or that base of the plant and it holds moisture there and that just slowly causes it to rot and break down and then in comes all the bad things all the pests all the disease all the pathogens you name it that's when things start to happen it calls decline of that plant health so avoid direct contact make sure the mulch is two to three inches deep because it helps with weed suppression as well as um, 
uh, weed suppression as well as that soil moisture control. So you're, you're using water more efficiently and effectively by uh, keeping water from evaporating. Um, but make sure you're using sustainable materials like leaf litter, pine bark, or pine needles. Don't use like cedar, cypress, rubber, or stone. Um, and again, no volcano mulching. This is the proper way to mulch. You actually keep for your tree, you actually keep the area around the flare of the trunk open and you only actually have like a bowl that's two to three inches um, and like a big circle around the tree because it helps direct moisture down towards the root ball. Um, so no volcano mulching. I've had some guys get mad at me like professional guys because they're volcano mulching and I start pulling back the mulch while they're working on other trees. <laughs> I want to recommend doing that. You make enemies that way unintentionally. But anyways, so no volcano mulching and two to three inches of mulch is going to be best. So fertilizing, uh, the any fertile if you have a lawn um, or that turf grass fertilizer that you that you put out is going to meet the ornamental plant needs. So it would be no unless you have something that's nutrient deficient, which you might see like fruit producing trees like a citrus, um, you never have to apply anything throughout the year. They'll once they're established, they're a-okay. Um, because both our trees and our shrubs will have extensive root systems, which allow for nutrients to uptake. So or allows them to uptake more nutrients. So they're like scavengers. They get these big roots that they're reaching all over the place. And they're like, yoink, 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 yoink. They're grabbing all the different nutrients that they can get. So they're able to pick up quite a bit in the landscape, really reducing any need for them. So typically for fertilizing trees or fruit producers or palms, and there's specific palm fertilizer that you can get um, that's easy to help make sure you're maintaining your palms correctly. Um, but only apply as needed. You don't have to apply it regularly. There's really no need to. Um, and But only apply as needed if nutrient deficiency is, deficiencies are present in ornamental plants or in the trees themselves. And you usually see that by a leaf discoloration that's happening all across the plant, not in just certain spots, but uniformly around the plant, you're going to see leaf discoloration. So let's talk about watering. So once shrubs and trees are established, you really don't need to irrigate them at all. I mean, that's one way that um, we're talking about functionality of landscapes that if you can reduce your turf grass um, because it's not necessarily the right plant in the right place, it serves no function. Um, even if environmental conditions are met, you can increase that landscape ornamental bed area and uh, significantly reduce your water usage because once shrubs and trees are established, you really don't need to irrigate them at all. Now, there are times that you can irrigate during times of extreme drought stress, and you can hit it with a, certain plants with a hose, or you can turn on your entire drip irrigation system, but that really will be determined. It's not like, oh, we're in a drought you know, every month I need to make sure I irrigate it. No, it really depends on actually your soil type, your slope, your plant type. So, um, what you really need to do is just monitor your plants and themselves to kind of just determine what needs water and what doesn't. And by looking at the signs for what needs irrigating, like the droopy leaves, the crunchy leaves, that can be a good indicator. Um, but typically, you don't need to irrigate at all. And our rainfall is more than sufficient for them. So now let's talk about pruning, because pruning is always a common thing that we need to do. So like, why, why do we prune? You know, I don't, I like to call myself a lazy gardener. So I say, why prune? Well, we can use pruning to reduce size. Now that's only if you have a plant that might be uh, too loud. Um, too loud, sorry, that is too large. And you need to prune it down. But if you think about the size of what a plant will get, you may not need to prune too much to reduce the size. Um, but otherwise, it's improve shape and appearance. It can actually increase flowering or fruiting. It can improve structural integrity of trees, which is really important. You know, we had Elsa come through Latcher County recently. Um, and, you know, wind damage associated with any hurricanes, if we can reduce and minimize damage to trees, which will minimize and reduce damage to um, um, you know, buildings and structures, that's going to be significant. But remove any dead or damaged growth from plants or um, plants, the shrubs or the trees. And it can also, the pruning can help rejuvenate shrubs. So let's talk a little about trees, shrubs, grasses, and palms. Not turf grasses, but like ornamental grasses. So looking at these two trees, what do you see? Which one do you think is a stronger, healthier tree? 
say the left or right image. You can put that in the chat box. I can't find my chat box. All right. Yeah. <laughs> you all are getting it right. Huh? <laughs> yeah, it's the right side. The right, the, the image on the right is is healthier with regards to structure of the the, uh, the the tree. So the image on the left, you can see how tight and compact those branches are coming off that, and there's no really central leader of that tree. So they're all compact. So that means that's going to be really easy for them to break at all those joints in places where all those branches kind of meet right in that one part of the tree. So that is like wind damage ready to happen right there. Now the image on the right, you can definitely see that there's much better structure to the tree. It's not as condensed in that in that branching. Um, and it has a, a little bit stronger central leader, um, but that does look like a live oak. So it's not going to have a trip typical central leader that you might think of for some trees. Um, but also in the image on the right, that tree that's in the background, <laughs> I would say that is not as healthy of a, of a tree with regards to pruning. So yeah, so improving the structure of a tree will, is, I mean, it's so important. It's so important because it helps make sure the tree is healthy as well prevents breakage. Um, and it just, I mean, if we're thinking trees can impact our home quality, our home values by like 10%, 10% by having a strong, healthy, mature trees in your landscape. That's huge, you know, 10%. And that requires having healthy trees. And if you don't have healthy trees, you're going to lose that value added to your property. Um, so there are trees that obviously branches that you can cut yourself. Um, and there's, we have what's called a three cut method. Um, and that three cut method, that is to help protect the trunk of the tree. Um, where you come about your first cut, you come out about 12 inches and you actually cut on the underside of the branch. You cut up about three quarter, about halfway, not quite past that. And you go a little bit further up the branch and you start from the top and you cut down until it breaks. And what happens is that first cut becomes the break point and it helps protect the trunk of the tree. Because if you just cut right at the trunk of the tree or what we call the collar, then the branch could fall from the weight and it'll actually peel part of that bark off the tree and it'll damage that collar, making it much harder for that tree to not necessarily heal, but withstand the damage of the pruning because they don't like pruning much, much better than a breakage. <laughs> um, and then once that main chunk falls off, then you come back and you can cut your third, which is flush with uh, to the collar. But obviously pruning trees is very, 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 very dangerous. So um, it's always important to reach out to a certified arborist to do any type of big major tree work because if it involves anything that you're uncomfortable with don't do it um because maintaining and pruning trees is can be deadly um if not done correctly so you can find a certified arborist actually on the website treesaregood.org slash find an arborist and that takes you to the international society of arboriculture and they are the ones that kind of do the whole certifications for arborist so you can actually go on that directory and you can specifically go well, that's county find your town and all that and it'll show you all arborists that are within your area so that's a wonderful resource for anybody that's needing to do tree, tree work um, they call our office and they say what's a good arborist we just send them that link <laughs> so uh, but anyways so pruning of trees helps um, so talking about now shrubs. So there are different times you can always prune shrubs to help with the health of the tree rejuvenate, but there's also timing that you need to be considered about sometimes as well. So um, evergreen shrubs, you can prune them anytime. You can do thinning of them that you like. Um, you know, light shaping or grooming, you can do that anytime. One thing that's always important that you need to be considered of is so there are some plants that flower on last year's growth. So you need to make sure that you don't prune too late because you're essentially cutting off the blooms for your next year. And a great example are like azaleas, uh, camellias and Indian hawthorns. So like azaleas, prune them right after they're done flowering. Um, but like 4th of July, that's your cutoff date. If you prune your azaleas after the 4th of July, you're going to start losing flowers. Um, they, or it won't be able to flower as much that next year. Um, <clears throat> 
So anything that flowers on new growth, you can prune it before the spring flush and throughout the summer. So it kind of gives you a little bit longer to prune. And pruning shape is kind of important. So looking at the image on the bottom right, you can kind of see that shape. Um, it's a little different than what you might see in most landscapes. So you can see how it's narrower at the bottom. That essentially the top of that shrub is shading out the bottom. So it kind of creates weaker poor growth at the bottom, where if you put the narrow at the top, then what ends up happening it allows bring more sun into the bottom of the shrub. So pruning isn't a shrub isn't always necessary, but it's just more of a matter of timing on when you do it based off of your shrub type. So let's talk about ornamental grasses. So ornamental grasses, all you got to do is just once a year in the early spring, right after our last frost, just go in with some shears like you see on the image on the left and just cut 12 inches above the ground, your clumps, bloop, just like that. That's all you got to do. And that will, uh, that's all you need to do for that pruning at that time. For palms, um, you don't really have to prune any palms. And if you do prune them, all you do is got to prod off, remove the dead fronds only, no green fronds at all. Um, there's no such thing as hurricane cuts or hurricane pruning. That's all wrong and false. Um, that's going to do worse, worse things for your palms than anything. Um, but you can't always remove anything dead or um, you can remove any dead or living flower fruit and stalks if you'd like. But nonetheless, you don't have to prune unless necessary, but you know, um, none of the hurricane pruning. So now let's jump into that last one is that um, uh, pest management. <laughs> so what is a pest? How do we define a pest? Go ahead and put that in um, the chat box. What do you call a pest? Something that hurts my plants, I like that. <laughs> Some things humans don't like. Something that damages the ornamentals, annoying little things. Those are all good. So um, a pest essentially can be weeds. It can be insects. Um, it could be mostly anything that you um, don't like in your landscape to a certain extent. Um, and but the real pests are the ones that are going to be causing damage to your landscape. So it's going to be like your diseases, your pathogens, your those insects that are like mealybugs, mealybugs, aphids. Um, so and actually we're thinking about like all the things that are in our landscapes like bugs and insects. Only 1% of the insects that we have in our landscapes are actually or maybe 1% roughly is considered a, a pest. So this is the tornado, tomato hornworm. <laughs> so you see them on your tomato plants. But when we're managing pests, we always think about what's called the integrated pest management system. And this will really hit on everything that we talked about because people will call our office all the time to troubleshoot issues that are happening in their landscape. And it goes back to really maintenance. So pest management really starts with scouting. It's just when you're walking around your landscape, just seeing what's is there anything causing damage do i see anything that's irregular um and making sure that you you uh identify and you can reach out to the county extension office to help identify anything that you have within your landscape um because if you can identify a pest early it's much easier to control and take care of um but we're thinking about integrated pest management just proper management proper plant selection right plant right place following that those right uh, those best management practices from everything that we've talked about so far those are called cultural controls so if you honestly just follow those then you shouldn't have a pest issue you will probably still have pests coming in and out of your landscape because they're always going to be there but they're not going to be at the threshold that's going to be really causing any damage or much concern so you know there are times where if you're following cultural control practices that it's like okay i'm still having a small pest damage or pest issue like i have an aphid on or aphids on this branch you know i'm not going to pull out the chemical controls and spray for those aphids i'll probably do some type of physical or mechanical what i'll do is i'll just clip that branch out with some pruning sneers and i'll dispose <laughs> shears and i'll dispose of that branch in the trash and issue is done <laughs> there are other biological controls that you can do like you know um 
air potato is a major invasive species. And a great example of biological control is the use of the air potato beetle that we just kind of release. And that just munches, that's an insect that munches on the air potato and it helps control that population of that invasive species significantly. But if like you go through cultural um, and it doesn't work, you can't go through physical and mechanical controls, it doesn't work. And you go through biological controls and you still have control of it. Then that's when you can sort of say, okay, what are those chemical controls that you can use to help manage the pest in your landscape? But honestly, if, if you go through all of these, it's going to be very rare that you actually get to, or not as often that you get to, um, having to use some type of chemical treatment to manage pests in your landscape. Um, and that's important because what can end up happening is if we end up just, first thing we go to is we apply an insecticide or a pesticide in our landscape, and then we come back and we apply it again, then we apply it again, those pests end up creating resistance, so then that pest, that insecticide or pesticide no longer works on that pest and that's like well there that goes you know it's no longer an effective control um and so starting with the cultural controls and just managing your landscapes properly is gonna really make sure that your landscape is strong happy and healthy because then again it's going to reduce what you have to do in your landscape and if you want to be a lazy gardener like me then you don't have then it really helps reduce what you need to do but it's important to know that you're always going to have insects. You're always going to have, there's going to be stuff in your landscape. I mean, that's, that's a given. It can't be pest-free. That's, that's not a reasonable expectation. Um, so some damage to plants is natural. Don't strive for a pest-free yard. Instead, decide on a realistic threshold of damage. So there's going to be some damage, but if it comes, the pest damage plants, and then they go and it'll recover on its own, cool. That's awesome. So there's always going to be some pests. So if you have St. Augustine grass, chinch bugs are always like the notorious pest. So if you're managing your St. Augustine grass well, um, you're still going to have chinch bugs in your turf grass, but they're just not going to be at a population that's actually causing damage. So you can still, you may still have someone like always knock on your door, say, excuse me, but we uh, did an inspection of your landscape and you have chinch bugs. It's like, okay, cool. You know, I managed my turf grass well, so they're, yes, they're there, but the population is not at a threshold in which it's causing damage. So that's important to understand that you're never going to have pests free. They're always going to be there. It's just a matter of how bad is the population and is it causing damage to your landscape. So now let's go ahead and let's just jump into those local resources because we go towards 530, but I want to make sure that we have enough time to answer questions. And luckily, this local resource this is just me wanting to make sure I'm showing you all the information or great ways that you can get this additional. And I'm going to send this to you all um, that you can find specifically for here, Alachua County. So you always have the county extension office. That's where I work. Um, you have IFAS extension, Alachua County. And that's where you can reach out to us at the very bottom point seven. Um, it's the Master Gardener Volunteer Help Desk. You can send an email or you can make phone calls. I'll have that contact information on the next slide as well. But that's a great way. It's like reach out to us for anything that's happening in your landscape. It's like, Taylor, you said in this one class, A, B, and C, but I can't remember what you said about it. You know, as simple as that, or it's like, I'm having a huge issue, or I'm trying to select certain plants. Use us as a resource to help guide you into making those decisions, um, because that's what we're there for. We're here to help provide that education and extend that science-based information to you all as part of our extension service with UF IFAS. We also actually have a county Florida friendly landscaping webpage that really takes all the Florida friendly landscaping program information and puts it in the context of Alachua County, because we do have our county fertilizer ordinance or irrigation codes, and that has all our recommendations in there. There, um, for with sorry, it has all the floor friendly landscaping stuff within that context of Alachua County. Um, third is Alachua County Environmental Protection Department. They're a wonderful resource. Um, they have a water resources department, and that's head by Stacy Greco. Um, her and her team are fantastic. If there's ever any issues, you can reach out to us, uh, reach out to them or out to us, especially if you have any issues, if you're living with an HOA and there might be a disagreement between the homeowner and the HOA or differing parties. They also have a really cool program with called irrigation tune-ups um, where if you, you can, someone can come out and they can actually work with you to make sure your irrigation system's working appropriately. Um, and I forgot to put it on here, 
my bad, but they have a they have a grant funded program that they get to use and they currently have it open right now. That's called a turf swap program where their goal is to think about what's that non-functional turf grass and can we reduce it, that turf grass area and increase that ornamental bed area to help with um, water use and reduce water consumption. Um, so that's a neat program, a grant program that they do that it's grant funded. Um, we have our YouTube page. Um, where it's all recorded webinars that we do. So this is gonna be included on there with all these links as well. But it's like, if you're interested in vegetable gardening, wildflowers, um, turf grass management, irrigation, um, composting, it doesn't, we, we have so many topics that we do throughout the year that, that that has become the channel where it's like, you can go and anything that we do, recorded webinars or other videos, education promo videos, it's gonna be on that YouTube channel. Um, so we also have our Facebook page, always feel to reach out to us and follow us on there. But we also have a podcast called Extension Cord. And that's really kind of just a podcast. It's on um, Spotify, Apple, all major carriers. And um, what it is, it's just like a monthly podcast where we just talk about things that are happening with an extension, typically within a horticulture realm, but we'll also talk about agriculture, um, food safety, hurricane safety. So that's a really neat thing that you like resource that if you're driving or commuting that you can have handy. So anyways, and as well as always reach out with any of your issues that you have, reach out to our Master Grower Volunteer Help Desk because like two of our panelists that we have on today, Mark Frank and Ann Hudson, they are two of our Master Gardener Volunteers. Um, Anne is really, really handy on the help desk. She's really helpful and very knowledgeable. Mark Frank helps out on the help desk at all. It is also a botanist at the herbarium. So if you ever have any issues with plant identification, you can reach out to our office or you can reach out to the herbarium and Mark Frank and they, we can help do ID of different plants for you. So coming back, rounding everything back out to those essential questions is what is UF IFAS Extension FFL program? So we talked about that at the very beginning, the nine principles, the role of extension, um, and then why this program is so important. So, and then we talked about what are those essential landscape management practices. So we talked about turf grass, irrigation, ornamental beds, and pest management. And then we just talked about what are resources available to homeowners in Alachua County. So always feel free to reach out to us. Thank you all very much for taking the time. Um, I have one resource I want to show you all, and I'm going to follow up with it um, in an email as well. But um, always reach out to our county extension office or your county extension office for any questions that you have. And always remember, with your homeowner's guide, don't panic. So it's important. So thank you all very much. Oh, the deer resistant plants. Yes. So deer can be nuisance <laughs> in the landscape. So let me go ahead and stop share. And I'm going to actually open up this other document. Whoop, wrong one. Whoop. Okay. Uh, I have to pull it up first. So this is a document I'll send you all and... Um, This is a document that I'm going to be sending everybody, and this is actually a homeowner landscape guide that we're creating as part of this program. So every time that we do this program, this is going to be something that we introduce or be able to distribute. Um, so eventually it'll be hard copies. So you all just get a digital copy for now. It is pretty extensive, but a lot of what it is, it's covering all those major topics um, and things that we talked about. So um, you can see over here, there's Ask IFAS publications. So those are all publications from the university and they go into turf grass, trees, ornamental plants, fruits and vegetables, landscape design, specialized garden styles. So we have just a whole bunch of resources. And the goal is that this would be a document that you can keep on your bookshelf um, and then you can pull it out at any time you have any questions to have those at your fingertips. Um, and as well, it has the state uh, the Florida Yards and Neighborhoods Handbook, which really jumps into the nine principles um, in a lot in more depth than what we definitely talked about today. Um, so this is um, something that's part of this program, and we'll get this distributed to via email. Um, but by next time we do this program, it will definitely be a hard copy um, that we can distribute to everybody. Because the goal is to have this as an in-person program where we actually do more workshop. We can do hands-on activities as well. 
So um, thank you all very much. Are there any other questions that we have? So I do have, um, whoop, I lost it. I got pulled up. We do have a follow-up survey and that follow-up survey is, um, we do for all of our programs to help track how our program is developing and evolving. So this uh, specific survey, this is the first time we've done this program. So um, getting feedback from you all on on this will be important for how this program grows and evolves over time. So I'm going to put this link, you'll get it in your follow-up um, email, but I'm going to put it into the chat box as well. Um, so if you want to start working on it now, you can. Um, but I'll be sending you all the resources, the links, that uh, booklet, that book that we're creating, um, as well as the link for the survey and all other pertinent items. So. Yeah, and welcome. So if how many of you have, um, those are still here in the chat box. Um, are you all, how recently did you move to Alachua County? Now I know some people have been here for a while and Brian, <laughs> but this is important. I know why you're here. So, um, but anyways, how long have y'all been in Alachua County and are you a, are you a first time homeowner? Cause this is, that's kind of like one of the target groups that we're looking at is like, you know, I bought my first home a year ago and like, luckily I was confident in landscape management and all the stuff, you know, knowledge with extension. But like, if I was buying a home for the first time, oh boy, you know, that'd be daunting. It's like, wait a minute, I got to maintain this now. <laughs> oh yeah. So that's like the perfect time, I, I feel. So you've been there for a bit now, but you're you're probably now at the time where it's like, we need to make some changes because we're well established. We're in this place for a while. Yeah. Yeah, so these are a lot of things it's like, yeah, you might be a new homeowner and like that first couple, first year or so, it's gonna be like maintain what we have. And it might not be for a few years before you actually do some of those big changes that you may finally want to do in part of your landscape. Yeah, there's always there's always lots to learn. <laughs> I'm always learning things, you know. And earlier at the very beginning, someone put in the chat box. It's like <laughs> that they want to figure out how to not kill plants, and that always happens. And I always like to joke that you know you have people that say it's like oh I have a brown thumb because I kill everything, and I always like to joke and say well yeah the difference between someone with a brown thumb and a green thumb is is the people with the green thumb admit that they kill things and like. Yeah, I'll figure it out. I'll do something different next time. <laughs> oh, yeah, tree roots can be a nuisance sometimes, especially in a mature canopy. So there's a lot of times we might think about what's the plant, what's a plant choice that would do better underneath that canopy. So um, because, but sometimes it's just it, plant roots can be right where people need to walk. So it can be very problematic. Um, uh, two years ago, I think it was, uh, there was somebody that like their homeowner's insurance was like, we're going to drop you because you have exposed roots in around this tree canopy where people can walk. And that's a huge liability, of course. And it's like, well, dang, that's pretty, that's pretty severe. So what we did is we just had them expand their uh, ornamental bed and put plants in that area because they didn't have to walk there. And all of a sudden those plants covered up all the roots and the homeowner's insurance was like, Cool. <laughs> so they didn't lose their homeowner's insurance. Woo. And they beautified their yard. So I think that ended up being a win win. So, yeah, monkey grass. I love like using lor Loriope and um, Mondo grass. That's really good if like you have turf grass or like say your mature trees. Uh, they're getting larger so that you have more shade in your landscape and turf grass quality starts to decline. You can bring in some of those plants that do well in kind of that semi shade, part shade, part sun conditions that might be too shade for turf grass. Like Liriope and Mondo grass are great ways to kind of like fill in. They're not, they don't like heavy traffic, of course, but for low use areas, they're wonderful wonderful like if you have stepping stones and like to create a path and you enter plants like mondo mondo grass around those oh it becomes so beautiful it's really nice in a shady landscape oh 
Oh, yeah. So worms can be problematic some days. Yeah, especially the cut worms. <laughs> So worms can are beneficial, of course, for the soil, but sometimes you'll have larvae for some other insects um, like moths or lepidoptera um, that can end up causing damage to plants, um, moths or butterflies, um, and that they can be problematic and cut worms. Oy. Yeah, and I feel your pain with cut worms, <laughs> but worms are super beneficial with soil health. All right. Any other questions? Well, shoot. Well, hey, you know, thank you all for joining us today. I want to appreciate, I really appreciate Mark and Ann taking their time to help us out today. They answered a lot of questions, provided a lot of resources in the chat box. Um, but always feel free to reach out to the County Extension Office for any questions that you have. You know, we're here to help you all. Um, you know, troubleshooting, helping make proper decisions when you're changing your landscape. You know, that's our goal is to help provide that science-based information and always feel free to reach out to us because like I always like to tell people, we we don't really have a stake in the game except for you to be successful. So um, that's why it's really nice to reach out to us because we're unbiased in what we're providing and it being that it's science-based, it's very, very nice. So, all right. Well, thank you all and Mark and Ann, thank you so much. Um, and thank you for joining and helping out today. <laughs>